In this video, we cover the most essential elements required for training neural networks. In the previous video, we covered a very high level view of neural networks, which focus mainly on the inputs and outputs and how the results are interpreted for an image classification problem. In this video, we'll continue with the same example and delve deeper into how an image classification network is trained. To train a neural network to perform image classification, we need three things. Labeled training data that consists of thousands of images from each class along with their associated class labels. We also need to define a cost function, also referred to as a loss function, which is a numerical computation that quantifies the error between the network output and the expected result. There are many different types of loss functions we can use, but in this example, we use a loss function called mean squared error. Finally, we need a process for updating the weights based on the value of the loss function. So let's start by taking a closer look at how the training data is represented and also how we compute the value of a loss function. First, let's consider a single training example, which consists of the input image, which is the input to the network, and also the class label for that image. Class labels are usually strings, but we need a numerical representation for the string. In this example, we have three different classes, so we can represent the classes numerically with a vector of length three, where one of the entries is a one and the others are all zeros. So the vector one zero zero represents a cat because we define the first output from the network to represent the probability that the input image is a cat. Likewise, the representation for a dog would be zero one zero, and for the third category, the representation would be zero zero one. The particular order is arbitrary, but it needs to be consistent with the network design and the data set. This kind of representation is called one-hot encoding and is a very common technique used to represent class labels. The labels for the training data are often referred to as the ground truth and are typically set to a variable called y. Notice the output from the network consists of three floating point numbers between zero and one. The output vector from the network represents a prediction and the vector is usually called y prime or y hat to designate it as an estimate of the ground truth. Here we show an example where the network produces an output vector with entries 0 0.37, 0 0.50, and 0.13. Since the second value is the maximum value, the predicted class label for this output represents a dog, which is obviously incorrect, but we'll use this as an example for how to calculate the loss for a single training example. One way to quantify the error between the network output and the expected result is to compute the sum of squared errors as shown below. As an example, we're calculating the error for a single training sample by computing the difference between the elements of the ground truth vector for the training sample and the corresponding elements of the predicted output, and then squaring each of those terms and computing the sum, which in this case is 0 0.66. When neural networks are trained in practice, many images are used to compute a loss before the network weights are updated. And therefore, the next equation is often used to compute the mean squared error for a number of training images, which is just the mean of the sum of squared errors for all the images that were used. Other loss functions can also be used, however, they all require a numerical representation for the input image class label and the predicted output of the network. Now that we have some idea for how to represent the error between the input to the network and the expected output, we can start to think about how we can use that information to train the network. Fortunately, there's a principled way to tune the weights of a neural network, which is called gradient descent. For simplicity and visualization purposes, we're going to illustrate the concept with just a single tunable parameter called w, and we're going to assume that the cost function is convex and therefore shaped like a bowl as shown in the figure. The value of the cost function is shown on the vertical axis and the value of our single trainable weight is shown on the horizontal axis. And let's assume that the current value of the weight is WE1. Referring to the plot on the left, if we compute the slope of the loss function at the point corresponding to the current weight, we can see that the slope is negative. But you can also see from the figure that in this situation, we would need to increase the weight to get closer to the optimum value 
indicated by W0. So we would need to move in a direction opposite from the sign of the gradient. On the other hand, if our current weight is greater than W0, as shown in the plot to the right, the gradient would be positive, but here we see that we'd need to reduce the value of the current weight to get closer to the optimum value of W, and therefore we still need to move in a direction that's opposite from the sign of the gradient. Before we continue, we just wanted to clarify one point in case you're wondering. First, notice that we're using the terms gradient and slope interchangeably. But the main thing we wanted to point out here is that in both figures, the arrow that we've drawn to represent the gradient is pointing to the right. In one case, the arrow is pointing down and to the right, and in the other, the arrow is pointing up and to the right. But don't be confused by the fact that both arrows are pointing toward the right. What's important is the sign of the gradient. Remember that the slope of a line is defined as the rise over the run, and that when we're to the left of the optimum value, the slope of the function is negative, and when we're to the right of the optimum value, the slope of the function is positive. So it's the sign that's important, and it turns out that in both cases, we need to adjust the weight in the direction that is opposite from the sign of the gradient. So with these two figures in mind, we can show that the following equation can be used to update the weight in the proper direction regardless of the current value of the weight relative to the optimum value. And the best way to think about this is that it's the sign of the gradient that determines the direction we need to move in, but the amount that we need to move in needs to be tempered with a parameter called the learning rate, which is often a small number much less than one. The learning rate is something that we get to specify and is not something that is learned by the network. Parameters like this are often called hyperparameters to distinguish them from trainable parameters such as the network weights. In practice, the cost function has many uh, dimensions and is not typically convex but has many peaks and valleys. In the general case, the slope of the cost function is called the gradient and is a function of all the weights in the network. And therefore, the gradient is a vector in multidimensional space. But the approach used to update the weights is conceptually the same as described here. To make this a little more concrete, let's take a look at the plot on the left and do a sample calculation for updating the weight. Here, let's assume that the current weight is referred to as WE1, which has a value of 0.38. And we'll also assume that we have a learning rate of 0.01 and that the slope of the loss function at the point WE1 is equal to minus 0.55. So using the update equation above, we can easily compute a new estimate for the weight, which we'll refer to as WE2, which is 0.3855. This calculation was simplified because we're only working in a single dimension, but this is easily extended to multiple dimensions. One thing we haven't talked about yet is how you actually compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to the weights in the network. And fortunately, this is handled by an algorithm referred to as backpropagation, which is built into deep learning frameworks such as TensorFlow and PyTorch. And so it's not something that you need to implement yourself. Now that we've covered all the essential elements associated with training a neural network, we can summarize the process in the following diagram. Here you can see that we have an input image on the left and the output from the neural network on the right, which we refer to as Y prime. We use the ground truth label Y, which is part of the training data, along with the predicted output from the network to compute a loss. And notice that we don't specifically show multiple outputs from the network, but it should be understood that both Y prime and Y are vectors whose length is equal to the number of classes that the network is being trained for. After we compute the loss, we can compute the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights, which can then be used to update the weights in the network. So this is a nice way to summarize at a very high level the process for training a neural network. Now that we have some idea as to how we can update the weights in a neural network, it's worth emphasizing that training a neural network is an iterative process 
that typically requires passing the entire training set through the network multiple times. Each time the entire training set is passed through the network, we refer to that as a training epoch. Training neural networks often requires many training epochs until the point where the loss stops decreasing with additional training, as you can see in the first plot below. It's also very common to plot training accuracy, and as you might expect, as the loss decreases, the accuracy tends to increase as shown in the second plot. There are many important details associated with training neural networks that we haven't covered in this video. But as we progress through this series, we'll continue to introduce more advanced concepts on this topic. Now that we've covered the process for how to train a neural network, it's worth talking a little bit about what we're going to do with it. Once you have a trained network, you can supply it with images that haven't yet been classified and use the network to make a prediction as to what class the image belongs to. This is reflected in the diagram below, and notice that at this point, we don't require any labeled training data. All we need are images with unknown content that we wish to classify. Before we conclude this video, we just wanted to summarize some of the key points that were covered. Now, starting with the fact that labeled training data is required to train neural networks for supervised learning tasks such as image classification. Uh, oftentimes, the input images uh, must be pre-processed so that they conform to the size and shape expected by the neural network. The uh, neural network weights are typically initialized to small random values. Training a neural network requires a loss function, which is used to quantify the error between the uh, network output and the expected output. The gradient of the loss function is computed using an algorithm called backpropagation, which is built into deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. And then gradient descent is the process that's used in an iterative manner to update the weights of the neural network. And then finally, training progresses until the loss function stabilizes and stops decreasing. So that concludes the introduction for how to train a simple neural network for image classification. And in the next video, we're going to dive into a coding example and show you how you can use TensorFlow and Keras to solve a linear regression problem using a neural network. We hope you found this video helpful. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.